Hey music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If music moves your soul, simply you're going to want to subscribe below. Be a part of this community where you'll get daily content celebrating the best of the rock era. You can also become a member of our exclusive club, The Dean's List, by clicking on our Patreon link below where you'll get more content, more videos, more interviews. You'll want to check that out. Now, we started a new show recently called The New Standards. In the early days of popular music, there were great songwriters like Cole Porter, the Gershwins, uh, Harold Arlen, Johnny Mercer, Duke Ellington, so many more who wrote classic songs that have lasted for almost a century at this point, really because of their timelessness. These songs were designated as the standard of the popular music canon. And I believe since then, there have been a handful of songs from the rock era that deserve that same reverence. Uh, they're sacred for their unique qualities, and this show celebrates those masterworks. Now, last time we covered Pictures of You by The Cure, a life-altering song, and today we celebrate another great one, but you can't guess who it is. Um, now, the 1955 film Rebel Without a Cause captured the hearts and minds of teenagers that grew up in the 50s and beyond. Um, the movie's lead actor, James Dean, was a cultural icon of teenage disillusionment and social estrangement. James Dean was killed in a car crash while driving his Porsche Spider to a race in California. Uh, this was shortly after filming Rebel Without a Cause. They hadn't released it yet. His legend grew with his untimely death. Now, James Dean was also an idol for a young Stephen Patrick Morrissey. Maz identified with the characters that James Dean played in his films, especially the role of Jim Stark in Rebel Without a Cause. I mean, Maz even wrote a book about James Dean before he formed the Smiths. It's called James Dean is Not Dad. I think it's been out of print for a couple of years, but uh, I tracked it down uh, as a teenager. Of course I did, I had to. Because uh, Morrissey became the voice of the tortured and conflicted youth. He became a champion for the disenchanted of the 80s and beyond as the singer and the lyricist for one of the most influential bands of all time, the Smiths. My personal feelings on the Smiths are extremely wide and very deep. They're my favorite band of all time. And personally, I consider them to be the 80s equivalent of the Beatles, creatively, for sure. Look, I know everybody says this about their favorite band or artist, and it's become a little bit cliche, but I would not have survived my high school years, my teenage years, without the music of the Smiths. They created the songs that saved my life, and I know many of you feel the same. I'll put it this way, I named my firstborn after Morrissey. My son, I'm not sure I'd talk my wife into that one, but you get the point. The Smiths, like few before them, or in any classification of art, they never have one creative misstep. I mean, in my opinion, they always acquired artistic perfection. Morrissey and Marr are the greatest songwriting duo since Lennon and McCartney. And in my own opinion, this is me, the greatest songwriting duo in history, period. I'll argue this until the cows come home and probably weeks after. I mean, you think about their output from 1983 to 1987. There was a self-titled debut album, The Smiths, Meet is Murder, The Queen is Dead, Strange Ways Here We Come, and of course, their brilliant compilations of some of their singles, Half Full of Hollow, The World Won't Listen, Louder Than Bombs. And they recorded and released all that incredible music in five years. Five years, and again, not one misstep. Show it to me, you won't find it. In 1986, with The Queen is Dead, you could say that was their masterpiece, but that's a little bit of overkill because every one of their studio albums, like I said, are watershed records in their own way. However, the songs from The Queen is Dead um, are perhaps the ultimate manifestation of Morrissey's bold and unrelenting melancholy and innermost longing for human connection. Life is very long when you're lonely indeed. Maz has always spoken plainly to the loneliest people in the world, and his words are rooted in the deepest struggles of the human condition. And they somehow gave us hope, hope and faith that there was someone out there who knew exactly, who knew exactly how we felt. I mean, Morrissey communicated lyrically in a way that maybe one or two other singers or writers in history had ever done or will ever do in my mind. It's an irrefutable fact that Morrissey is the greatest lyricist in pop music history. For me, it's Moz and Robert Smith, who are known enemies, but they have the natural ability, um, and you have to go back to the greatest poets of the preceding centuries for equals. I mean, Keats and Yeats and Wilde. <laughs> and then there's Johnny Marr. I mean, he's written songs 
in chords that most guitarists could never even dream of. He does things musically that I won't even begin to try to understand or pontificate about because they're worlds beyond my understanding. I'll just state that I know that uh, my ears are deeply entranced by his playing and it ties my soul into blissful knots of enchantment and bewilderment, really. I'm not the only one. I've done a myriad of interviews with artists who have had the exact same experience with Morrissey and Mar and the Smiths. And I'm gonna show you a couple of clips with some of these artists and, and that influence. But before we do that, I wanna show you today Zenny frames that I'm wearing. I picked these ones out because they kind of remind me of similar frames worn by both James Dean and Morrissey back in the day. And I actually had them engraved. Professor of Rock on the side here with a music note. You can actually have them personal engraved things. The inside of it says Child of the 80s. I added that. Um, I love Zenny because, like I said before, they're low in price or high in style. And you can click on the link below to get this pair exactly or others. You will want to check that out. Here are the interviews. So I got to ask you about the name. I hate to ask bands about their name, but your name is a tribute to one of my favorite songs of all time, Panic. Burn the out. streets of London, yeah. you know, the Smiths, and it's got the, the most famous line that uh, burn down the disco, hang the blessed DJ, because the music they constantly play says nothing to me about my life. And that's what Morris was saying, I believe after hearing a Wham record, that's what inspired that. But there you have, taking that quote, you guys are kind of keeping that flame alive in this brain dead kind of auto-tune pop top 40 that we live in. <laughs> what, uh, how do you feel about that, man? Um, I mean, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I definitely look up to, you know, people like Morrissey this, that, have, that have just inspired us to make music and inspired me to want to create something that um, wasn't fake. I mean, I don't think that I could make something that didn't hit home for me. The Smiths, I mean, you look at Morrissey, in a river, the color of lead, immerse oh, yeah. the baby's head, yeah. rapper upper in the news of the world, dump yeah. her on a doorstep and go, yeah. oh, you did a good thing, you did a bad thing, I'm not happy, I'm not sad. Like... What? I know. Do you know my dad when he first heard that I was listening to the Smiths and he heard this is this is when it changed my life really. I had the whole collection of the Smiths. I was probably nine, ten and a half, right? And when he heard some of the songs from the Smiths This night has opened my eyes. You were just quoting. And when when it, and if a double decker bus smashes into uh, us to die by your, your side, side what you a know, heavenly way to die. Words like that or sing me to sleep. I'm tired, which is clearly or about suffer, wanting suffer to- suffer little children. Yeah, which is clearly Manchester, about- Manchester, <sighs> so much to answer for, right? <laughs> yeah. Which is clearly about him wanting to let go of this world. Yes. There is another world. There is a, There must be. There must be. And yep. as a child with depression, when he heard that, he threw away all my tapes, like threw them away. Wow. Would not allow me to listen to them anymore. Of course, I went and rebought them. <laughs> of course. And then he would find them and throw them away again. Gosh. But the fact that that just, oh my God. Do you remember, well, I wonder. I mean, I can go and stop me, uh, uh-huh, stop me. Yeah. Stop me if you think that you've heard. Paint a vulgar picture. Paint a vulgar picture. Favorite. Or young bones groan in the rocks below <laughs> say, throw your white body, body down. Because I'm going to meet the one I love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 my God. Man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> It's it like, is, it's brilliant. It is. And then shoplifters of the world unite and take, take over. over. Yeah. Songs that saved your life. You know, <sighs> I love, I love that. I can't tell you how many times I felt as a teenager, you know, I dealt with depression my whole life, you know, um, been on meds since I was 14. But I remember listening to that song, Sing Me to Sleep, Asleep no, yeah, by the Smiths off Louder Last Than Bombs. Last song off Louder Than Bombs, yep. Over and over and over oh, yeah. and over and over again. That song saved my life so many nights. Oh yeah. You know that song, and please, please, please let me get what I want oh, this Oh my gosh. Come on, One that, that mandolin solo at the end. Oh yeah. <laughs> 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 I know. Oh yeah. You know, that's what it's all about. And it's and the, the Smiths, I mean, they saved my life. Oh. Well, the queen is dead like I was just talking about. I know it's over. Oh, that's, oh. Yeah. Oh mother, yeah, I can feel. I can feel the soil falling, falling over my head. You see, the sea wants to take me. The knife, the knife wants, wants to, to cut, cut me. me. Do, you Do you think, think you, you can, can help me? me? <laughs> oh, oh well, well, the it. end when he's just like, over, over, yeah. over. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to voice. laugh. It's so easy, easy to hate. Fact, I think that was my senior takes, quote. It takes strength, strength to be gentle, gentle and kind. kind. I love it. 
Now, in my mind, the Smiths have quite a few songs that are modern day standards. Today, I'm gonna go with one that Justin Furstenfeld of Blue October talked about. Uh, the Shakespearean-like tragedy. There is a light that never goes out. It's been called the national anthem of Smithdom by some. It's the sacred indie rock hymn of the late 20th century, or as original Smith bassist Andy Rourke termed, the indie candle in the wind. I like that. The song was, of course, influenced by multiple touchstones of culture from the world of Morrissey, the 60s death discs being one, such as this one from the many girl groups that Maz adore. Another element of the recipe was, of course, the influence of the New York Dolls, their brilliant song, Lonely Planet Boy, where David Johansson sings, driving in your car, and how could you be driving down by my home when you know I ain't got one? Also, Morrissey's love for film and the Albert Finney, Shirley Ann Field classic, Saturday night and Sunday morning, where Phil pleads with Finney saying, why don't you take me where it's lively and there's plenty of people, which probably inspired the line, take me out tonight, where there's music and there's people and they're young and alive. There's also an early take of the song where Maz sings, there is a light in your eyes and it never goes out, which could have been a tip of the hat to the girl group, the Shirelles, and the Phil Spector hit, Will You Love Me Tomorrow. That stuttering intro was said to come from the Rolling Stones cover of Marvin Gaye's Hitchhike. Apparently, There Is A Light That Never Goes Out came from the same late night session that produced Frankly Mr. Shankly and I Know It's Over. Now let's take a second to let that sink in. Morrissey and Marr wrote those three songs, There Is A Light, I Know It's Over, and Frankly Mr. Shankly in the same night mind blown. Johnny Marr has talked about that night in the past. He said, and I quote, Morris, he was sat on a coffee table perched on the edge. I was sat with my guitar in a chair directly in front of him. He had a Sony Walkman recording waiting to hear what I was going to pull out. So I said, well, I got this one and I started playing these chords. He just looked at me as I was playing. It was as if he daren't speak in case the spell was broken. End of quote. When Marr listened to the final studio recording of There Is A Light That Never Goes Out, he called it the best song he had ever heard. He also gushed about Morrissey's brilliant singing at the end, and of course he was right. Morrissey's angst and his outright romantic obsession is unparalleled because the combination of his interpretation and the poetry that he's singing, it's just amazing. It is a quintessential song by the Smiths with that perfect convergence of uh, Johnny Marr's talent as a music composer and Morrissey's superior lyricism. Marr's craftsmanship on the tune is outstanding. In addition to lead guitar, Marr played the synthesized string section, which was originally opposed by Morrissey, but uh, the band didn't have the money in their recording budget to hire an actual string section, so Morrissey relented. <laughs> I gotta say, I don't think it would have sounded better. I think what Marr did was, was phenomenal for the song. Incorporating the synthesized string section in the song showed really intuitive empathy for the song's storyline on Marr's part. It gave There Is A Light the, the mood of a, a bittersweet misadventure and it really accentuated the song's uh, throat-lumping emotional intensity. <laughs> Now, there are parallels between Rebel Without a Cause and There is a Light That Never Goes Out. So going back to James Dean, the song's narrative is the perfect companion piece to the theme of the film Rebel Without a Cause, with a terminally misunderstood protagonist battling against the social status quo. The line from the movie, It Is Not My Home, is paraphrased in the song's first verse. Because it's not my home, it's their home, and I'm welcome no more. And then, of course, there is that connection with the real-life car crash that took the life of James Dean and uh, Morrissey's car crash fantasy of taking the life of the song's narrator along with his driving companion. Well, Morrissey sings, to die by your side is such a heavenly way to die, and to die by your side, well, the pleasure, the privilege is mine. 
That's where the Shakespeare drama comes into play. As a final act of desperation, I'm likening the double suicide of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. But the narrator's vision of a heavenly way to die doesn't appear to be shared by the driver uh, that he's enamored with. Uh, at least we're not sure if the driver's desires the same fate. In a darkened underpass, the narrator thinks that his chance to die with his friend has come at last. But then a strange fear grips me, and I just couldn't ask, as the narrator would say. But then a strange fear gripped me, and I just couldn't ask. We're left to believe that there will be another time and another place for a new opportunity to arise. But maybe the light of life is the light that never goes out. And to die is not the ideal option after all. Anyway, very interesting. Morrissey's penchant for the unconventional is also wonderfully on display with his vocalisms. Um, in the song, you know, there's a part of the song while singing The Pleasure, The Privilege Is Mine, where Morrissey purposely hits a sharp note while singing the last syllable in a higher octave. He also cleverly fills in a time gap by singing in a non-lexical to stay in sync with the song's melodic tempo in the second verse. I never, never want to go home because I haven't got one. la de dum oh, I haven't got one. You know, I just love that. It's just brilliant. Because I haven't got one. These things that Morrissey does, very unique. Smith's fans have always known, though, that this song was important, um, all-consuming. All over the world, in just about every facet of our culture. I mean, the way it was portrayed in 500 Days of Summer. Uh, well, let's just say that Hollywood finally got it right. You like this, Smith? To die by your side is such a heavenly way to die. I love him. Irving Welsh's novel, Train Spotting, has a chapter specifically named after the song and mentioned it outright. My relationship with this song is uh, really difficult to put into words, but I'll try. When I was 16 years old, I remember there was this girl that I had been in love with for, for so many years. I was head over heels, this girl, and uh, we finally came together. That moment, she just she broke my heart completely, beyond compare. Um, I'd never felt so sad, and at that same time, my relationship with my mother and my father just completely broke down. Deep peril. Um, I had to go live with my grandmother as my father and I couldn't be under the same roof any longer. We just were doing this and I was in the deepest state of depression that I've ever experienced, even to this day, because I was so young. I just felt completely lost and just utterly rejected, especially by those people that are supposed to love you unconditionally. I felt like I'd been forgotten, just thrown away. Um, I was at the height of loneliness and desperation for the least bit of connection to anyone or anything that could soothe me, you know, soothe my aching soul or even just fill it with a, a centimeter of hope. At the bottom of those seemed like endless miles of emptiness that was at the center of my being. And, and this song, or more accurately, this hymn for the forgotten outcasts, of, which I felt like its pathetic leader. I mean, this beautiful song, it just enveloped that very large gaping hole in the middle of my soul like a, a bright and shining light in the darkest abyss. I can still see that, that scene from so long ago. I was sitting there lying in this bed in old makeshift room in my grandmother's tiny house, feeling completely alone. Uh, I was the slave to some very dark thoughts and I remember hearing these loud voices in my head that had me convinced that my life was useless, worthless, meaningless. My headphones were on, the Queen is Dead played, and this song came on like a revelation. I listened with a fierce desperation. I was holding on for dear life, clinging to every word sung. Take me out tonight where there's music and there's people and they're young and alive. Driving in your car, I never want to go home because I haven't got one anymore. Because I haven't got one anymore. Even though he'd written the song like six or seven years before that, no one will ever take away the knowledge that I have. I'm telling you, Morrissey knew that I needed to hear that. He wrote it for me. Morrissey wrote it for you too. I mean, he knew that you and your unique perspective or damaged plot in life needed to hear that. He knew that we needed to know that there was, there was someone, someone out there who had perfect empathy for 
exactly what we were experiencing. Let's be clear, uh, Morrissey was the originator of the It Gets Better movement. He, he was, this song. I mean, in the Smith song, Rubber Ring, Morrissey eloquently sings, the passing of time and all of its sickening crimes is making me sad again. But don't forget the songs that made you cry, the songs that saved your life. Without question, the songs of the Smiths have saved innumerable lives, including mine that night so long ago. In the bleakest of moments, in the most unrelenting darkness of life, Morrissey was that light. And all these years later, this song is still a light never goes out. Uh, okay, leave us a comment about this divine duo, Morrissey and Marr, this life-saving band, the Smiths. Share your thoughts, your memories, your anguish. Really want to hear that. Now, you can get this shirt that I'm wearing. You can get the Queen is Dead on vinyl and their other music by clicking on the Amazon links below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. Hit the bell so you know when our video um, is coming out, all of our videos. Join us on Patreon for more content. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thanks for watching.